so next up uh, in my aesthetics and embodiment uh, reading list, I took on this little book um, called On Beauty and Being Just by Elaine Scarry. Um, Elaine Scarry uh, is the Walter M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics at Harvard uh, University. And she wrote uh, probably her best known for its um, uh, aesthetics content book, uh, The Body in Pain in 85. And uh, she came to kind of somewhat more uh, notorious attention when the TWA flight went down. And I, I don't know if it was ever actually resolved, but she's the one who published the big editorial in the Post or the Times or something about how she was under the understanding that it was a government conspiracy and um, the plane was shot down through government like uh, radio wave interference. Um, so she's uh, someone with a very interesting kind of perspective on the world, to say the very least, and uh, is an endowed chair in aesthetics at kind of one of the bastions of uh, aesthetic uh, thinking and kind of philosophy in general. So uh, a little bit of a preamble to this is, um, I think, useful. Uh, one of the contexts uh, into which this text is going is a general decline um, in the concern for the aesthetics uh, broadly in the academy in terms of uh, philosophy. Now, uh, Johnson addresses this um, in his book um, Meaning in the Body, which I addressed last time, and Scary addresses it too uh, in a very different way. Uh, she has no desire whatsoever to um, crumble challenge, uh, attack, or defeat uh, the kind of standard Western uh, assumption of the mind-body problem and uh, isn't really interested in addressing embodiment, uh, as far as I could tell, at all in any substantially different way. She is attempting to reclaim uh, an old school appreciation of uh, aesthetics. Um, so old school, it's almost as if uh, one reviewer of the book said she doesn't know that the 20th century happened. I mean, she really is writing um, in a way that almost seems naive in terms of the kinds of things that have happened. It's not as if I don't think that she could handle them. She just chooses not to address a lot of the critique um, that comes up um, with aesthetics or came up with aesthetics in the 1900s. And certainly hardly anything uh, that came up uh, past 2000. Uh, what she's doing in here uh, in the book is tying the appreciation um, to beauty uh, with being just. And uh, I want to address this book in kind of two pieces. One is what she seems to be saying, uh, and two, uh, kind of my review uh, and kind of critique on her commentary. I want to split those up this time. I, Elaine Scarry, say that the beautiful is important because uh, our perception of the beautiful can be incorrect. What's that? Well, there are sometimes things that you think are beautiful and then you later realize are not, and some things you think are not beautiful and you later realize they are. In the cases where you suddenly realize something that you have had uh, an experience with is beautiful and you didn't realize it was, there's this captivating moment that's this transfixing moment when you realize that you were wrong, that your perception of beauty in the object, uh, the poem or the sculpture or the person, or even she says the math equation, um, is in fact beautiful and you didn't realize it and boom, there's this moment where you brush up against the ultimate, kind of the noumenal realms of, of, of other ultimateness um, and some things happen in those moments. Uh, in the first section, she says, she just kind of describes this process by which the evaluation um, and the 
and the means by which one can be wrong of their aesthetic evaluation takes place. And the second half of the book, she says, um, when you realize you're wrong and you brush up against the beautiful and it captures you, um, you become decentered. She says on page 111, at the moment we see something beautiful, we undergo a radical decentering. Beauty. Um, requires us to, quote, give up our imaginary position as the center. A transformation then takes place at the very roots of our sensibility in our immediate reception of sense impressions and psychological impressions. Just the single best or most obvious thing in our surroundings, which is an occasion for unselfing, that's another way she says, decentering, is to uh, encounter what is popularly called beauty. That's 113. The, the thrust of the on beauty and being wrong part is that um, she says there are things that you observe um, kind of sensorily that you do not think are beautiful uh, or you do not appreciate and then you come to understand in fact are beautiful and you know this is an, a reasonable thing to consider that there's a there's an album that you buy um, to the degree that people buy albums anymore for a particular song uh, and you listen to the album but really you're listening um, for uh, the, the, the certain track on it and then years later uh, you start to really come to an appreciation for another track and you say man how come I never realized what a great song this was or some equivalent thereof so the concept there is fine and she says um, that that beauty because it has this element of you know, um, the possibility of being wrong about it. That is, you thought that the thing that was beautiful was on that um, kind of album, only this track, but it turns out there was beauty in the other track that you didn't perceive before. She categorizes that as being wrong about an aesthetic judgment. And then when you come to the rightness about it, uh, it, it kind of strikes you and you, you cannot help but kind of succumb to the uh, awareness that you were wrong about your aesthetic judgment. It is not a poem or a painting or a palm tree or a person that is true, but rather that it ignites the desire for truth by giving us with an electric brightness shared by almost no other uninvited freely arriving perceptual event, the experience of conviction and the experience of, as well, error. This liability to error, contestation and plurality for which beauty over the centuries has so often been belittled, has sometimes been cited as evidence in its falsehood and distance from truth, when it is instead the case that our very aspiration for truth is its legacy. It creates, that is beauty, without itself fulfilling the aspiration for enduring certitude. It comes to us with no work of our own and then leaves us prepared to undergo a giant labor. Um, she's arguing that in uh, meeting the beautiful, the aesthetically uh, pleasing, we uh, brush up against something that captivates us, that uh, transforms us. And because we're aware that beauty is a category which is liable to error, contestation, and plurality, um, and yet in spite of all of its ambiguity, we still are sometimes transfixed uh, by the beautiful, uh, by encountering the beautiful in this way, we end up ourselves being transformed uh, and prepared to, as she say, undergo giant labors. Uh, she gives no mechanism uh, by which uh, encountering this beauty, which somehow uh, transforms us and leaves us ready to do the next great thing, uh, happens. But she affirms that, in fact, it is the case that this does take place. Um, uh, she says in the section on page 62, the, the kind of thesis, I think, of the second half, uh, it is the argument of this chapter that beauty, far from contributing to social injustice, uh, actually assists us in the work of addressing injustice, not only by requiring of us constant perceptual acuity, high dives of seeing, hearing, and touching, but the more direct forms of instruction sketched in the next parts of the chapter. Um, 
by realizing that we can sometimes be wrong about aesthetic perception, as she addressed in the first half, uh, we come to realize we need to practice having better perceptual acuity, being able to take in the world and see really what's going on. And she says, if we get good at that, training ourselves with arts and literature and kind of beauty, then, in fact, when we are up against uh, a societal uh, ugliness, uh, injustice, we will see it more clearly and then presumably change it, although she doesn't address that. So her argument for how it is that perceiving or understanding or coming to understand that something is beautiful leads to social justice um, is, is kind of pushed uh, onto page 80. Uh, and she says, um, when we see something that is perceived as beautiful, uh, and it kind of transfixes us, uh, we become bound up with it and an urge to protect it or act on its behalf in a way that appears to be tied up with the perception of its lifelikeness. Um, something about us, about it, makes us feel like we're more alive and so we attribute to it lifelikeness and therefore want to protect it. That's the argument there. Um, and she also points out here that um, when we, on 81, uh, kind of get captivated by it, our attention is thrown kind of to the other, outward beyond ourselves. And she says the practice of uh, uh, perceptually, with perceptual acuity, perceiving the beautiful, becoming transfixed with it, and then only be concerned with it so that you're no longer concerned with yourself, develops a, develops a habit of other regard, which is um, necessary for um, social justice. Uh, one of the things she does that's interesting is kind of make a, uh, an argument for the category of beauty uh, being notably different than other um, kind of similar, all important, uh, and I would write here kind of Western Greek categories. And she says that it, one of the interesting characteristics of it is that someone who pursues goodness or is interested in studying or learning about goodness um, presumably does so in hopes of making oneself good. If you're pursuing truth, um, you hope that yourself, that you become wise. If you pursue justice, that you one day hope that to be able to count yourself among the just. Uh, there is, in other words, a continuity between the thing being pursued and the pursuer's own attributes. Although in each case there has been an enhancement of the self, the undertaking and the outcome are in very deep, uh, in a very deep sense, unself interested, since in each case the benefits to others are folded into the nature of my being good or bearing knowledge or acting justly. In this sense, it may have been misleading to phrase the question in terms of a person's hope for himself. It's more accurate to say that one cannot further the aims of justice without placing oneself in the company of the just. However you phrase this, though, beauty is something utterly different. It does not appear to be the case that one who pursues beauty becomes beautiful, or even intends to. It may even be accurate to suppose that most people who pursue beauty have no interest in becoming beautiful themselves. It would be hard to make the same description of someone pursuing the other objects of aspiration. Could one pursue truth if one had no interest in becoming knowledgeable? This would in fact seem like quite a feat. How exactly would one go about doing that? Where would there be a way to approach goodness while keeping oneself uh, free of the good? Again, a path for doing so does not immediately suggest itself. And the same difficulties await us if we come up for ways of furthering the ideas of justice while remaining ourselves outside of the reach of the just. Uh, and so she says the reason that beauty occupies this kind of other uh, category uh, is because of this uh, discontinuous break that when we uh, apprehend beauty, kind of it apprehends us and it thrusts us out beyond the normal self um, kind of other dichotomy into a kind of a blown out distributed sense of awareness. And that when we do that, um, we... Uh, uh, go beyond the normal categories, and in fact, going beyond the normal, she says, is in fact where we touch the ultimate, the kind of, uh, the, the other noumenal sphere, and therefore develop this taste of, of the sacred. Um, so, that's her position, and that's her reasoning for it, and I think it's very interesting and horrifically done. 
Uh, this is a weird, weird little book. Uh, for someone who presumably is kind of incredibly intelligent and capable and a, an academic, uh, the arguments are bizarrely um, disseparate. I cannot say I would recommend you read this book unless you're um, looking for kind of the a academic equivalent of a slight acid trip. Um, you read little bits and pieces of it and it seems really beautiful and then you get to the next part and you have no idea how you got to where you are from where you were. Uh, so her argument, she tries to lay it out stepwise, but it's very, very difficult to track in between sections, let alone between the halves of the book. So I've kind of summarized her, her argument and um, tried to do it in such a way that the book itself is clear. but. Um, it's worth reading a couple pages at a time because she's a very talented writer. The prose is, is beautiful, but, but it's not good in the sense that, uh, not just that it's not like academically well done, but it's also really hard to follow. Uh, so like at the micro level, the prose is great and fun. And there's some really interesting sentences and paragraphs. As a text though, as a monograph, the flow of the whole thing um, is bizarrely, um, disconnected from itself even. So um, uh, I would love to have a conversation with Elaine Scarry and ask her if she did that on purpose because it's possible, given her thesis, that the book is just supposed to be a, a collection of beautiful pieces of text um, and it's supposed to make me feel uh, like I encountered the ultimate um, via her beautiful prose and she has done something to help me feel like I need to work towards justice for the world. Uh, but that would be giving her an awful lot of credit when I think it's just quite possible it's a weird little book written in a weird little way by someone who is quite possibly weird and little herself. Um, not bad, just bizarre and full of discontinuities. Um, good thoughts, funny container. Elaine Scarry's On Beauty and Being Just, 1999, uh, Princeton University Press.